just the sheer amount of work that we have to do over the course of the project. Um, eight bridges, almost a million yards of earthwork to move. And if you look at that as all of a task to do in a day, it seems impossible. But if you kind of break it out day by day in small bites, it's a lot more manageable and easier to wrap your head around. The system interchange of I-86 and I-15 is nestled between the seas of Pocatello and Chubbuck, Idaho. Originally built in the 1960s, the system interchange's bridges were nearing the end of their design life. However, during discussions with the community, the Idaho Transportation Department determined replacing the bridges was not the only work that should be done to update the interchange to modern standards. We expect uh, the service life for a bridge to be about 80 years, and so as we started thinking about the investment that we're going to go into, there was actually two bridges that need to be replaced, which kind of started the thought process about this project. And as we started thinking about that, the question we asked is, does it currently function from a movement standpoint from one way to the other, or are there issues with it that need to be corrected and some deficiencies? Um, as they started looking at it, they looked at the operational um, opportunities that take place out there. and. <clears throat> The, the old interchange that was designed in the 50s and built in the 60s was, had some operational challenges. Um, there was um, left-hand offs, left-hand ons um, as you go from 15 to 86 and 86 to, to 15, um, which didn't meet drivers' expectations. The Pocatello Creek on-ramp was a challenge for truck drivers. The grade is such that they couldn't get up to speed, and so they'd reach speeds of, at their best, 45 miles an hour, and then have to go through traffic, which was going 65 miles an hour in order to exit heading westbound 86. We have some loads that are uh, over 300 feet long um, that, you know, when you have loads that long, they, they off track, um, and so they don't follow the the path of the truck as well as a lot of shorter trailers do. Um, so we have one ramp that is um, restricted in, in um, over 300 length, foot length uh, trailers. We thought that rather than perpetuate those challenging movements, we have an opportunity, we had and do have an opportunity to correct those again to make the entire system safer. Um, it's cool to have the management back us up where we can take a complicated uh, project where there's multiple moving parts, multiple, uh, many different disciplines that have to go into the project and combine them as one and do it in-house. We have some skilled staff that are good at the jobs that they do and they enjoy a challenge. Sandy rose to that challenge as the main designer on the project. It was wonderful. Eric Statz was amazing and, you know, wanted to keep this in-house. And um, my boss, Aaron Baird, he was like, I've got this designer that she learns real quick. Um, and I think, you know, with all of with our support and resources, uh, she can lead this. and. Um, and again, I said, yes, I think I, I can do this. Uh, when it was designed, most of it was done in a 3D model. And I did presentations to the board, actually, for the model, showing them the model, how the project was going to eventually look in a picture, a 3D visual versus on a plans. And also to be able to hand over the model, essentially, to the contractors so they can put it in their equipment um, so they can use GPS for grade control, um, and you can see where the busts are in, in the 3D model versus on a plan sheet. You can tell if something's going to work or not based on the lines and grades visually, rather than waiting until in the field and saying, oh no, it doesn't, it's not working, it doesn't fit. Uh, one interesting facet of the project is we're actually taking what used to be the Chubbuck Road overpass that took Chubbuck Road over I-15 are actually putting I-15 over Chubbuck Road. So what that essentially does is it removes an overhead structure or an overhead obstacle for large loads that 
that are traveling on I-15. So that's one way that it improves trucking. Another benefit to that is we have a chance to make Chubbuck Road a lot more accessible to pedestrians and that's a big benefit to the community because we have the Port of Fultonist complex to the east of this Chubbuck Road underpass. It has a lot of recreation opportunities with the man-made lake, a lot of uh, recreational fields, uh, amphitheater for concerts, just a lot of opportunities for recreation and uh, pedestrian activities. Another aspect that we did to further connect pedestrians to that complex is to help install a section of the Greenway, the Pocatel Greenway, along the east side of our project, along our right-of-way line, to get another portion of that built to further connect that Greenway system and link it to that one less complex. The funding is, is unique, um, so the the, the governor put out his um, leading Idaho um, plan, and, and that gave us the opportunity to, to use state funds to, to bond. It enabled us to get started probably sooner than we necessarily were, were planning on. Uh, the Techum office was looking for an opportunity to, to get some funds on the road early. We were able to raise our hand and say, hey, we have an opportunity here in District 5. And what, that, what the Techum funding by the Techum office coming in and giving some funding to this project allowed us to free up additional bridge budget to be applied to other needs across the state. Really, Greg, Aaron, and I are, we call ourselves a three-headed monster or three-headed uh, PM. And we talk at least five times a day, if not more, as emails comes in, submittals come in, questions get asked. Um, it's necessary because none of us could do it alone. And uh, I'm glad that we talk and communicate so well because that makes sure that we're on the same page and we're communicating consistently and clearly to the contractor when we have those discussions. And I feel like we are doing a pretty good job of keeping up on the tasks of everything. And, and that's, to me, how we're doing a good job is I have a great group of guys that I work with and I definitely couldn't do this project without them. Knowing that you have your managers or the people that you work with that will support you in those decisions is very helpful and makes you a lot more confident. It's really nice to work with managers who have confidence in you and your skills and to know that they put trust in me to go out into the field and to make decisions and to observe conditions and to solve as many of those problems as I can on my own in the field and to know that they trust me in the decisions that I'll make uh, is, it's kind of cool to know that they have that much trust in me. And when you have a project this large, it, it takes the whole team and everybody um, has their defined role and, and usually they get to work outside of that role as well. Yeah, so the, I think the dynamics has been good, not only between them, but also between the entire project team. So from the very beginning, I try to create a culture on the project of one team, meaning it doesn't matter if you ITD, subcontractor, or Sun Cannon, we are one team focusing on making collaborative decisions that helps keep the project moving forward. So um, most, of, most of them have been able to embrace that, and uh, so it's, it's been good. I think one of the biggest lessons is never expect your project to be perfect. We can spend all the time in the world to develop the project, think through things, plan for what we think we can plan for, but there's always going to be surprises. There's always going to be differences in opinion on how things are interpreted. And I think the most important part to that is to be willing to listen to the other side's viewpoint and actually listen, try to see where they're coming from. And once you understand each other, then you can work to find a solution. The blame game does not constructively help you get through them. One is just the, the amount of work that has to get done. Um, when you're talking thousands of yards of material to be moved, um, you know, there's millions of pounds of rebar uh, in, this, in this project. So just the time and effort that it takes to, to get all that done. We have 
five different phases laid out for the project and subphases to all those phases. And if those don't get completed in order, uh, there's some flexibility in those phases, but there is a clear critical path that needs to be hit. And the moment one of those starts to slip, you really see a lot of ripple effects. Uh, the, the contractor contractor is working not only during the day, but in order to, to make the proposed schedule, they're working hours that we don't normally see worked. Uh, so they're working through the night. Idaho's weather has been a bit of a challenge for them as well. I don't think they quite anticipated how much cold weather we have and how much that would impact their, their earthwork in particular. As you can imagine, very challenging. You know, I mean, we, we're able to, to work when we can. Some days we can't. Some days we can work only a few hours. But uh, we view that as any time, anything that we can do to help, even if it is a small amount, to help the pro progress of the project moving forward, uh, we think is worth it. We still have to make sure that work vehicles can get in and out of the work zone, they can do their work, we can build the new interchange, but the emphasis from day one was to try and make sure that while we were building everything, we impacted interstate traffic as little as possible. We've done our best to really balance the earthwork within the job and make use of as much excavation on the job to use it as fill so we don't have to import as much. But that windblown silt and that geology of the area makes it difficult because that soil is really moisture sensitive. If it's too dry, it's dust. And we like to use the term moon dust. So moon dust is essentially referring to a native soil material that's very, very fine. So when it is dry, essentially it's like talcum or powder. Um, and then when it is wet, it is very, very slippery and muddy. Um, so there has been a dance trying to find just the right amount of water and moisture. Uh, the mo that's been coming out of the ground about seven or eight percent moisture. Our optimum moisture is closer to 14 percent moisture. And so with them adding it at the point of excavation, just with the the excavator at that point is then mixing moisture into it as he's loading the haul trucks. And then when the haul trucks dump and, and the grader or dozers spread it, it's blending that moisture in and, and, it, and it helps us get a much more uniform uh, grade or, or, or layer of uh, properly conditioned material. I, I think the community is interacting well. Um, we've, we've really tried a hard to, to tell them that this is going to be a long process, um, and it is. The, the ITD public involvement team has been mostly dealing with that. I do hear some feedback on some of the major items from our uh, ITD management team from time to time, um, but we've been working together to try to, like I said, minimize the impacts that construction naturally has on the traveling public and surrounding neighborhoods. And uh, we're excited. We feel like this will be a legacy project at the end that we'll all look back fondly on and say, man, those guys made some significant changes that are so much better than they used to be and that they had some forethought of how they were going to do future projects. And at the end of this, um, that was a successful project and man, it functions so much better than it used to. You know, for me, this is the type of project where we're building, building or rebuilding eight structures with an expected lifespan of 75 plus years. So they'll long outlive me. It's big enough and complex enough that you don't get to see many in your career, especially at ITD. Um, it's just a lot of bridges, a lot of road work, and a lot of complexity to the phasing that really makes it a unique and challenging project, and I think that's what makes it qualify. It's the, at this time, I think it's the second biggest project the state has ever done. And to me, that's just legacy in and of itself. And so to be able to be a part of that team and be able to work on this big of a project is, a, is an honor. Building these new bridges, new alignments is going to 
be forever known, if you will, or even past when, when we're all gone from here. So, um, and it's going to be remembered for, for the size. So I think that's kind of what the legacy means for me. Um, it is very rewarding, you know, to know that we are building a project that will improve the, the quality of life of our local community, um, along with bringing some good uh, prospect for economical growth. So very, very proud to be part of it. To build a project that won't just impact Idaho, Pocatello area, but will impact all the surrounding states as well. If you think about what type of projects are going to have a very long lasting impact. Um, as we look at this project and, and the design we've done, um, we're planning for this project to last 100 years.